the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Good morning, everyone. Are you awake or asleep? You sure? Okay. Today's gospel is a gospel that everybody really loves. It's a gospel in which I think many of us find ourselves in it. Many of us see the mercy and the compassion and we see really a visible repentance. And even in our church, we have the icon of Zacchaeus climbing the sycamore tree. So y'all are very familiar with it. Every single time you walk into the church, you're reminded of Zacchaeus climbing the sycamore tree. And this whole section over here is the story of repentance of people whose lives were changed when they encountered the Lord Jesus Christ. I thought for today we can really go through this passage and really understand kind of the state of Zacchaeus and understand why the Lord did what he did. There's very beautiful things that the Lord did today. So first off, anyone know what the name Zacchaeus means? The name Zacchaeus means righteous one. Now ironically, this is a man who is not just a tax collector, He's the chief tax collector. And a tax collector, by the way, you've heard me maybe say this before, but a tax collector is like public enemy number one. Not only are we under occupation by the Romans, but you now work for the occupation. And the way that you make money is not by just charging me my normal taxes, but by going above and beyond. So anything you collect, and the more that you collect, the more that you take home, and the wealthier you are. And in fact, to be the chief tax collector, that means that you have to be the one putting extra pressure on the tax collectors to make sure that they do their jobs. So not only was Zacchaeus a tax collector, public enemy number one, hated by all of his fellow Jewish neighbors, but also he's probably hated by the tax collectors as well because he's the chief tax collector. He's the one that pushes them. So this is a man that really, the nature of his life is he's not very liked at all whatsoever. And when you read how the Lord described, or the, the St. Luke describes him, it says that he was a chief tax collector and he was rich. How rich was this man? Really, how rich was he? You have all the money in the world. You have all the prestige, prestige. You have all the protection of the Romans. You have all the material possessions you could possibly want, but everyone hates you. Is he rich? Is he rich? I would say actually this is the most, the ultimate form of poverty. What good is it for a man to have everything, but to be despised, to be rejected, to be hated by all people? And I wonder what his desire was, why it says here that he sought to see Jesus. Like, what do you think the motivation was? What, what was going on in his heart that was maybe he had heard about his, his little minion, Levi, one of the people that worked for him, that had left being a tax collector and went and followed Christ. Maybe he had heard that Jesus dined with tax collectors and sinners. Maybe he had heard that this was, this new rabbi didn't look at his brokenness as a condition for following. Maybe he saw somebody that actually could see beyond his occupation, beyond his brokenness, beyond his shortcoming. And I think there's a question that you have to ask yourself and me first and foremost as we look at Zacchaeus. Was he exhausted of scamming people? Was his emptiness of life causing him to want to seek something more? And I think for many of us, this is our return to the Lord. Many of us have been far from the Lord for long periods of time. And when you taste of all that the world has to offer, there's a feeling of emptiness. There's a feeling that nothing satisfies as much as you, Lord. And sometimes people will say, Abuna, I've hit my rock bottom. I've hit the point where nothing seems to be satisfying me anymore. And I'm longing for something more. So he sought to see Jesus. He sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd. I want you to take note of this. If any of you have watched The Chosen, have any of you watched The Chosen? 
the new show that's been going on with Jesus. It's a very beautiful show. Some stuff is a little bit weird, but it's a beautiful show. There's crowds, multitudes of people, tons of people wanting to be around the Lord. And what this man does is he realizes his shortness. I like how St. Saint, Saint, Saint Luke writes that he was short. <laughs> I wonder, he's short physically, but he's also short in a lot of other ways. He had fallen short of his potential. He had fallen short of the gifts that God had given him. He had fallen short of the, the glory that God had intended for him to have. And I think for a lot of us, when we think of sin, we think sin is like a moral failure against God, like I did something wrong against God. But actually sin, the, the definition, is a missing of the mark, is a missing of potential, is a missing of God has invested so much and I haven't reached the potential that he has called for me to live in. And you see Zacchaeus is living in this short state physically, but also in this short state spiritually. So he ran. Why is a Middle Eastern man running? Any of you seen a giddo run in the modern context? Any of you seen even an uncle run? Like, if you see an abuna run, it's funny, right? Like wearing a galabeya, like we, we don't have much range of motion in this galabeya, right? It's, it's a funny sight to see. Why is he running? Why is he running in the midst of the crowd? And why after that is he climbing a tree? Like monkeys climb trees, cats climb trees. Why is Zacchaeus, the chief tax collector, the most rich, why doesn't he tell the Roman guards to come and to move all the people away so he can see Jesus? Ask yourself. Because he longed to see him, and when someone is exhausted of life, when somebody's exhausted of the circumstances that they've been living in, they'll do whatever it takes to find the Lord. Recently, I've had some encounters with people that have been far away from the Lord, and when they come back to God, there is this incredible fire that happens in them. They are so hungry. They eat every word. They read tons of scripture. They're listening to sermons. They're doing everything that they possibly can to taste Christ. And I ask myself every time I encounter these people, I say, Lord, give me back a return to my first love. Give me back the days in which I desired you. Give me back the days in which I hungered for you. Give me back the days in which I would sit and I would read your word and I would be so in awe of who you are. See, Zacchaeus does whatever it takes to see Jesus. My question for myself today is, am I doing whatever it takes to see Jesus? Am I hungering? Am I thirsting? Am I desperate for him? Am I longing to be in his presence? Have I seen and tasted that life outside of him is like food without salt on it? Have I seen and have I tasted that my life feels like it's bland and I'm trying and desperately longing? And Zacchaeus climbs up the tree and what does he do? He sits there and waits for Jesus to pass. And when Jesus came to the place, remember, he's surrounded by tons of people, multitudes, he looks up and he saw him. And he calls him by name. The chief tax collector, he knows him by name. He sees him, he looks up to him, and he calls him by his name. When you call somebody by your name, you know, people always say to me, Abuna, it's been a year and a half and you still don't know my name. I say, sorry, forgive me, forgive me. When you know somebody's name, it's a sign of intimacy. It's a sign of like, I know you. I know who you are, I know where you're coming from, I know you. When did Jesus see Zacchaeus or speak to him to know his name? Before you were even in your mother's womb, Zacchaeus, I knew you. Before you were even in your mother's womb, I knew you, and I called you, and I gave you potential, and I created you in my image and likeness, and I gave you all the hope and all the dreams and all the capacity, and I feel like sometimes we don't think the Lord knows us by name. Sometimes we think in our circumstances he doesn't see us. Sometimes we think our, we are too far gone. Our sin has taken us too far away from the Lord. And maybe, Lord, you've forgotten my name. Maybe, Lord, you've forgotten who I am. Maybe, Lord, you don't even recognize me anymore. I've been, I've, I've been running away from you for so long. Do you still know me? Do you still remember me? Do you still, like, see that I have any hope? And look what he says to him. He doesn't just say Zacchaeus. 
He says, Zacchaeus, come down. Get off the tree. What are you doing? What are you doing in that tree, Zacchaeus? Come down here. Today I must stay at your house. Jesus, are you sure you know what you're doing? Like, this man is hated and despised by everyone. He's not only the tax collector, he's the chief tax collector. Are you sure you know what you're doing? This person is too far. Let him go. He's the worst of the worst. Like, you know, I like Arabic. Sometimes Arabic gives very strong meanings. Like, fashion. Like, oh, a fashion. Like, he's a failure. He's, you know, he's, he's so far gone. Why, God, do you care about al-fashlin? Why do you care about them? Why do you care? Why do you care about those who are failures? Why do you care about those who are far off? Why do you care about those who've used and abused and taken advantage of people? Why do you care? So he made haste and came down. You know my name. You want to stay at my house? And me? Runs makes haste and receives him joyfully. The person who's been far from the Lord, finally when he knows that the Lord knows his name and he has ex encountered and experienced the loving presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, he makes haste and he welcomes him and he receives him joyfully. But then you always have the people in the background yapping. Hey, they complained. He has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. But I love this. You all know this? This is something really cool. I, I learned this recently. Under Mosaic law, under the Mosaic law, if you stole something voluntarily and you confessed your crime, you had to restore what you took. So restore what you took and add one fifth to it. This is from Leviticus chapter six. And then also bring an offering to the temple, a trespass offering. If someone stole something and could not repay it, could not repay it, he was to offer fourfold, fourfold. And if somebody was caught with goods and he had the ability to repay, he would repay double. So you see this? What does Zacchaeus do? He doesn't say, well, do I fall into this category or this category? He goes to the furthest extent. He goes to the furthest extent and says, I have, I have taken, first of all, look, Lord, I've given half of my goods to the poor. And if I've taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. I go to the furthest extent possible under the Mosaic law to return that which I have done to other people. I'm not sitting and saying, well, should I go to this person? Should I restore? Should I? He's not, there's no, he knows how far he was. He knows how much he's hurt. He, know much how, he knows how much he's wounded. And he asks the Lord not to give him the lowest from his own intentions of his heart. He goes and returns the furthest extent possible to those whom he's hurt and wounded and abused. That's the heart of those who've encountered Christ and had a true repentant heart. They're not, it's not enough for them to just follow the Lord. It's not enough for them to just make place in their home for the Lord, but they do whatever they can to be right with their brothers and their sisters. They do everything in their power to be right with their brothers and their sisters. I'm gonna say it a third time. They do everything in their power to be right with their brothers and sisters. It's not okay for me to come to church. And if I've hurt someone, to just leave it. It's not okay for me to come and welcome the Lord into my home, the home of my heart, and to have an issue with my brother and sister and leave it without doing anything about it. In fact, the Bible says, if you have an issue with your brother, leave your gift at the altar and go reconcile with him. See Zacchaeus, when did he have time to restore? Like he says today, I need to be in your house. So when did he do that? When did Zacchaeus go give half of his goods to the poor? When did he go? He immediately heard that Jesus was going to go, welcome to his house, and he ran and he said, like, desperately, here, I gave you this, I owe you fourfold. I gave you this, I did this to you. I, he's just giving radically to every single person and making amends to every single person that he has harmed. 
I think the hardest thing for many of us is that last part. It's easy for me to welcome the Lord. Easy for me to make space for him in my home, maybe. Easy for me to come to church on Sundays. Easy for me to take communion. The hardest thing in the world is to say, I've done something to wrong my brother and sister, and I have to make amends for it. Because Lord, the heart that you have for me is that while I messed up time and time again, you know my name and you call me and you welcome me. And maybe you may think to yourself, well, that person did something wrong to me. That person did, it's their fault. They should make amends towards me. Is that the condition that the Lord has for you? Does he say, wait, before I come and I die and I, and I take the weight of your sin on my shoulder, you have to first make it right? While we were still sinners, Christ came and died for us. While we were still far off, he came and restored us to our place once more with him. And our responsibility is to respond to the great love that he has given to us. Our responsibilities as being little Christs is to reconcile with everyone who's done us wrong. Now, does that mean that every single person is going to receive us joyfully? Probably not. Probably not. Maybe you'll go and you'll tell this person, hey, I'm sorry, forgive me. I've wronged you and I love you. And that person will say, you're this and you're this and you're this and you're this and you're this. Hadr, okay, I take it. Because this, this, hey, there's a problem. But I don't want this to affect this. Like, I don't want the horizontal to affect the vertical. Yes, I have an issue with you. But I, I, as much as I love you, I love my heavenly father who's forgiven me and who's cast my sins as far as the east is from the west. And because he has restored me and because he knows me by name and because he loves me and because he wants to welcome himself into my home and to dine with me and he with him, I will do everything in my power to reconcile with my brothers and sisters. You know, the first Sunday in Lent, traditionally, is called Reconciliation Sunday. The first Sunday in Lent. And they say, before you begin fasting, before you begin praying, before you begin doing almsgiving, go reconcile with every single person that you have had an issue with. There's two more weeks before Lent. March 11th, boot camp. Two weeks before Lent. Plenty of opportunity to reconcile with those who we have hurt, those who we have maybe taken from. And maybe some of us say, Abuna, I can't. Abuna, I can't. I'm so hurt. Me and Fash, you know? Me and Fash. I can't, Abuna. Say to him, Lord, allow me to know how much you've forgiven me. Allow me, Lord, how much, to understand how much you have done for me. Allow me to get a glimpse of your forgiveness towards me. Allow me to understand my own sinfulness and my own brokenness in order for me to demonstrate the same love towards others and even a fragment of what you've demonstrated towards me. And I think if our church was a church that practiced forgiveness and practiced reconciliation and really, really, like, you know, Abuna will start the prayer of reconciliation right after this. He'll hold the fefa. And that lefefta through the cross, a little veil, that cross is what tears down the middle wall between God and man. And then we say, before you come to the, lit the litany of the faithful, before we go through the rest of the service, you ought to greet one another with a holy kiss. This is not like, ahlan wa sahlan amli eh. You know, it's not like a, you know, a, a greeting of, this, it's nice to see you. It's a greeting of the peace and the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. The peace and the love that he has given me is what I offer you. That's actually what you should say. The peace and the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not like, hello, how are you? It's the peace and the love of, the Je of Jesus Christ. The love and the peace that he has given me is the love and the peace that I want to bestow upon you. And if I've done anything to hurt you, if I've fallen short, Lord, you see me and I've done what I can, and I have reconciled with every single person that I possibly can because I don't want to stand before you and to say, I've done everything, but I know that I'm a liar. The last thing you want to do is stand before the Lord and say, actually, you are good in everything, but one thing you lack, you didn't know how to forgive. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. How? Welcome into your home. Welcome him. Let him enter. Receive him joyfully. And when you receive him joyfully and you understand how much he has done for you and the great love that he has for you and the fact that he knows you by name, even though you've fallen short time and time again, even though I have fallen short million times before, he knows my name, he loves me, and it's from his love that I extend the same love to others around me. May God give us grace and may God give us wisdom and may God give us a heart like his to go and to seek and save that which is lost. Glory be to God forever.